class for astronomy and um, just very quickly was obviously a really good coder and really, really strong student. And then I kind of, I think I plucked you out to do a senior thesis with me. I think I approached you instead of the other way around. Well, um, so I don't know if you heard, but I do remember I was in your class and I was talking with, I think, Leo. Okay. And I was like, Leo, I'm on track to graduate next semester, but I haven't even started my senior thesis and I am panicking. <laughs> And then I like mentioned Python or something. And so I don't know if you heard this okay, at all, maybe I did. I but you remember. came over and I swear there was like a halo above your head. Yeah. It was like, man, you're good at programming <laughs> and you so, need a thesis. thesis. Okay, that sounds too coincidental. So I must've heard you, but, um, but I, I don't usually pluck students out like that. Usually they come to me, but um, you're a very, such a strong student programmer that I was like, I want Ben to work with to do this. And um, it worked out perfectly because Aaron Shaw, who's up on Zoom had, had been, I think you discovered about 1,500 observations over the last two years in this telescope that needed a pipeline building off of work that Alexis had done. Well, Ben built a really strong wrapper around it that we needed for about a year and a half and um, just did a fantastic job with it. So really, mm -hmm. really grateful that you did this project. Um, I think you learned a lot of fun science along the way with Aaron. Mm -hmm. And it's a, um, what's really nice about this in your thesis, it's a, it's a product that we're gonna use in the future. So it's not just a one-off, it's gonna be continuing along. So. Thank you, Ben, and congratulations on your last <laughs> assignment. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rich and, and Aaron, uh, um, for you know meeting with me every week and uh, helping me get all this stuff done. And uh, I really do think this was uh, one of the better projects that I've done throughout college. Um, when I had my job interview uh, for the position that I landed. Um, they scheduled an hour for it and we ended up going to an hour and 40. And the reason for that was they were just so fascinated with my senior thesis. They were like, yeah, we pulled your code down, we started poking through it, <coughs> this, that, and the other thing. Uh, so I think, that, you know, the, this senior thesis actually helped me quite a bit uh, with my career recently. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, also, thank you to Mom for helping me proofread uh, my paper a, a few times. Uh, thank you, Alexis. I mean, I, I did do a lot of work for it, but really, the, a lot of the heavy working is done by Photography Plus. So uh, <laughs> that was that was great. I apologize. You have to deal with the code. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, uh, that's that's my compliments. I'll I'll pick it apart a little bit as we go into the presentation <laughs> oh, a little bit more. Um, not too much, but uh, a little bit. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get started now. Brad and Mena might uh, walk in at, at any moment be a brief intermission as they get seated. Um, but my project is, this is a, it's quite a mouthful, but really all it is is Dr. Aaron Shaw needed someone to, to automatically perform photometry, uh, which is just getting the, the magnitudes, getting the apparent brightness of the stars we're considering for intermediate polars um, as they're entering these dips uh, or these low flux states that we weren't uh, anticipating initially. Um, so first we'll have a brief literature review and I'll go over the proposed observation and then I'll go through uh, how I set everything up in the pipeline and then we'll have a little analysis of the results that uh, we got from this project. So first white dwarfs are very important uh, from a cosmological perspective uh, this type 1a supernova happens when white dwarfs exceed their chenrose Sekar mass, which is the theoretical upper limit to the mass. This usually tends to be about 1.4 solar masses, but it can depend uh, a lot on the composition of the white dwarf. And you can see in this picture, this is um, Sirius, the Sirius system. And we have Sirius A here, and we have Sirius B as well. It's a binary system. It's one of the closest stars in the night sky to us. And the binary companion is a white dwarf. And the reason I really wanted to show this picture off is because even though theoretically in the past they were very similar in luminosity and would have been similar in mass, um, this white dwarf, it's a stellar core remnant. It has a much lower luminosity. And that's just shown off by this picture as the uh, series A just totally dominates over series B. That being said, they do emit uh, peak emissions in the UV because during the formation of a white dwarf, uh, 
after fusion can no longer happen, it shrinks quite a bit, uh, which causes the density to go up and causes the temperature to go up as well. However, all of this is just from uh, temperature radiating away. Uh, there's no longer any sort of fusion going on, so it's basically just a black body. And as time goes on, it will uh, decrease in <coughs> its emissions. So on to cataclysmic variables. Generally speaking, cataclysmic variables are called that because they irregularly will modulate in brightness, um, going through dips or spikes. The ones that we're concerned with are uh, binary systems with a white dwarf and a main sequence star. You can see a magnetic cataclysmic variable here that was drawn um, by Aaron's fiance. Um, and hmm. these white dwarfs tend to have slightly higher masses. Generally speaking, though the upper limit of a white dwarf is around 1.4 solar masses, we find them to be around 0.6 solar masses. And, but in cataclysmic variables, they tend to be around 0 0.8, 0 0.83 uh, solar masses. And we don't know exactly why this is. There's a couple proposed mechanisms that would get it there. You know, maybe the accreting material causes it to, to grow in mass. Maybe just it being a more massive white dwarf to begin with is what leads it to become part of a binary system like this. Um, those are a couple of the proposed mechanisms. And cataclysmic variables, there's several different types. Polars refer to ones with extremely strong magnetic fields, and it causes the accreting material, instead of forming a disk like this and then getting channeled onto the poles, it will just get channeled straight onto the poles of the white dwarf um, by the magnetic field lines. But we are mostly concerned with intermediate polars. These are another subclass of cataclysmic variables. They tend to have weaker magnetic fields than those of polars, uh, generally speaking, around uh, less than five times 10 to the six gauss. Uh, to give you an idea of scale, uh, the Earth is around one gauss. That's like the, the order of magnitude. Um, so at least a million times, or upper bound is around a million times greater uh, than that of the Earth. The interesting thing with polars is they have an in sync orbital period, probably caused by the uh, strong magnetic field, but intermediate polars have an out of sync orbital and spin period. And here we have a, let's see, what's it called? It's a long scar uh, periodogram. And basically, what that means is we took the power spectrum of the star and we ran it through an algorithm to try and get out a series, uh, all the different frequencies. And we can see here on, the, uh, on this image, we have dotted lines corresponding to the orbital period. So that's the period that the component, oh, come on, they're here. Matt, can you go get them in? Them in. No, they're, they're, I think they're just gonna come in and oh, sit. Oh, yeah. hi. That's great. <laughs> I'm to see, uh, I'm talking about stars. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, we have the orbital period of the uh, main sequence star and the white dwarf, can be seen in the power spectrum, and we have the spin period of the white dwarf, spikes a bit more strongly here, and then we have what's called the beat frequency, which is just the difference between those, and the associated harmonic. And so we find that these are slightly out of sync, uh, which leads to some more interesting mechanisms among intermediate polars. When we observe in intermediate polars, uh, they primarily show themselves in the hard X-ray band that's around 20 kilo electron volts. Um, this is despite the fact that white dwarves emit mostly UV. So how does that work? Well, when the accreting material reaches the closer radii, it begins to uh, heat up a lot. And as it gets channeled onto the white dwarf, onto the poles, it, um, it heats up even more so, and it forms what's called a post shock region. And it's this region that's responsible for releasing most of the X-rays from the uh, system. So recent, in recent years, intermediate polars have been found to undergo irregular dips in brightness. 
You can see here, this is an image from the American Association of Variable Star Observers, which is sort of a hobbyist thing. Uh, a member of our research group, Ava Covington, uh, compiled a lot of data to search for these dips that we've been finding recently, and this is her graph. Um, you can see that as time goes on, it makes a very clear dip, and we don't know exactly why. We do know that these low states correspond to a decrease in the rate of emission, uh, in the rate of accretion, but besides that, there's not a lot known about what's going on during these states. And a part of that is because observations like these are mostly done in the visible spectrum. We don't have a lot of observations done in the X-ray band. Um, and as I said before, the post-shock region, the, the region that's responsible for the matter accreting directly onto the white dwarf, it primarily releases in X-rays. To sort of really understand this, we do need to take a closer look in the X-rays. So Dr. Aaron Shaw proposed a, an observation of this, and to do that, uh, we had about 13 targets that, that are up here. Um, this, so the plan is to first observe in the visible spectrum using the Great Basin Observatory, and then uh, we will point a, an X-ray telescope at a target star should it uh, undergo one of these dips in brightness. So the Great Basin Observatory, it's in Great Basin National Park, uh, which is a national dark sky zone, so it's really good for observations. Um, we had 1,600 existing data points from March 2020 to April 2022, and we have more coming in <laughs> as time goes on, because this is an active observation that we're uh, still awaiting to really trigger. So we need a method to properly um, analyze this, and that leads to differential photometry, which is how you take an image, and really, for the most part, it's pretty basic. Uh, telescopes will take a, an image of the night sky, and then you calibrate it using uh, a few calibration files, and then you perform photometry on it. And all you do with that is you find a number of stars in the image uh, whose magnitude you do know. So that's what all these labeled reference stars are. We know all the magnitudes, and there actually are more that we used for this target. So we get the magnitudes of those, we count them, we get the magnitude of our target star down here, and we count that, and then we find a way to count the amount of light that we just get in the background. So in an area like here, you can see there's, there's still some sort of light there, so we don't want to count all the light that's not coming from the star, but is coming from the background. So we subtract out the background, and then that gives us a number for the counts of the, um, of the target star, and then the counts for the reference star. And then we can find the apparent magnitude uh, through this equation here, um, just relating the reference star to the, um, to the target star. And through this, we do this over each of the reference stars, and then we average them. And we get an error value from the standard deviation of that average, and that's what we use to calculate the magnitude. And we'll, I'll get more into the actual results of that later. In order to process all of this data, the 1,600 data points, as well as the ones coming in uh, frequently, uh, we need an automated pi pipeline to process this data for us. It's not feasible for this observation. We just have to do it manually, potentially every day. So first, some relevant technologies for it. I used a number of Python libraries to make programming this easier. Typer uh, really just turns any application that you write into a command line utility super easily. AstroPy lets you do all sorts of uh, astrolog or astronomy um, functions. My primary use for it was working with uh, a file system or a file extension called a flexible image transport system. Um, it allows you to append a lot of data to any given uh, image that has been taken. Uh, primarily for this, it's header data that includes things like the exposure time, the type of image 
uh, that was taken and the target coordinate data, things like that. And then one of the biggest heavy lifters here, uh, written by our, our own Alexis Tudor, uh, is Photometry Plus. Uh, this is a great application uh, with its own faults, but it does a lot of the heavy, heavy lifting. It does the actual uh, calculation for the photometry, um, and it will output a list of the reference stars. And I'll get more into the anatomy of the actual program in a second here. So when I went to create this, I, uh, I started by diagramming everything out, how I wanted it to work. And creating command line utility seems sort of roundabout for this, especially when Photography Plus already exists. Um, but by creating a command line utility and having a lot of the basic things be accessible to any user, it allows uh, much more easy uh, troubleshooting and it abstracts a part of the program away so that you don't really have to be concerned with it. In addition, uh, one of the issues with Photometry Plus was that it didn't have comprehensive enough logging. And so the command line utility takes care of most of the logging needs for this program. Um, it also adds in a few other uh, neat hacks, I suppose. Um, when we run Photometry, uh, I believe Photometry Plus had a, had a way where it would search in the title to match the calibration files based off of exposure and uh, filter type. Um, mine uh, will instead find the best calibration files by looking in the header uh, for the included information on exposure time. And then we have the command line utility done, then we have the cron job, and the cron job will run a run script which will uh, perform photometry and plot everything every day. And it defines most of the constants for the project itself. And then the cron job will gather all the outputs and logs and it drops everything into a Dropbox folder uh, where my postdoc, uh, Dr. Aaron Shaw, can go and look at it every day in case we see a dip happen in one of the targets we're observing. So he knows to trigger that observation. So now I'll go through my data a little bit. There were 16, well, at least at the start, there were 1,666 data points. And when I ran this data, about 1,277 of those were successful. Now that's a success rate of about 77%, which initially is not super impressive. However, when you consider that of those 1,666, uh, only 1,300 of them had coordinate data, which is just uh, the FITS file including where in the sky it is pointing to so it knows where to look for the stars. Um, so only 1,300 of those had coordinate data. Um, so I had to go and try and append it again. But of the 1,300 that had coordinate data already, uh, we had 1,277 successful, which is a success rate of about 96%. Now, when I went to a, a try and append all the coordinate data, it worked for we had 363 that didn't have coordinate data, so it worked for about 300 of those. But only of those 300, only about 26 worked, which among that new data set, so among the uh, 303, that's a, that's a success rate of 7%. And a part of the reason why, and the, the reason why this image is up here, is because there can be various issues with the data. This is called trailing. Uh, I believe it's when the uh, telescope is not tracking well enough the, the night sky, so it, it rotates as it's taking the shot. Most of our uh, data points are 300 second exposure times, so if it doesn't track the sky, it will get trailing like the one seen in, in this image. You can also get other things like overexposure or artifacts in the data, but I think from manually pulling apart the data a little bit, most of them seem to have issues with trailing. But this is a great number to have because um, of the 1,303 that worked, 96% is a great success rate. And the 77% success rate overall uh, is more a refl reflection of the Great Basin Observatory, um, which uh, 
my uh, professor has told me that they will appreciate uh, having this more concrete data as well. So here is the first plot that I'll show you that's mine that came out of the program is this one up here. Um, and I want to compare this one to one that uh, one that Rich made uh, earlier this year. Um, and this one is comparing the Great Basin Observatory to um, the Assassin Telescope. Um, and we can see that it matches pretty well with the Assassin Telescope observations. But moreover, so that's proof that the Great Basin Observatory can be used for these types of observations, and it works well. But if we take a look at this, this timeline is from right around here, and these dips match perfectly. So we can see that my program is also working as desired here. We'll get more into the rest of the plots as well in just a second here. Um, so here's all the plots of the targets that had um, a dip that I could find. Now, the, the issue with the finding dips is that there's no specific criteria for them. It's just when it enters a lower uh, brightness level, but you need to have a certain level of confidence. Like for here, you could try and say this is a dip, but that one's not confident enough because of the large error associated with it. So I didn't consider that to be totally a dip. Uh, but we had around eight from all of the observations that we had. Uh, over the course of uh, about two years. Um, and we can see that uh, this star here, uh, Dio what, Draconis, I'm bad with constellations, Draconis, um, it looks like it was just about entering into a dip here, but we would need more observational data to really determine that for sure. So now I want to talk a little bit about next steps for uh, this, this observation and uh, the programs in question. First, I love my program, but ideally the future is my program doesn't exist and most of the functionality gets absorbed into Photometry Plus and the bedrock for Photometry Plus just becomes more robust. There's a couple of things besides just the more robust uh, logging handled by my program that could be added to Photometry Plus as well. Uh, one of the main ones is an algorithm for um, uploading to astrometry.net, which I didn't touch on. Uh, we use a, an API called astrometry.net. It has an AI that will look at any image and affix coordinate data to it. Now, when we come across an image that doesn't have coordinate data, we send an API request up to astrometry.net. The problem with this is TITS files are large and it can be challenging for astrometry.net to uh, handle all of the data that we need to push. Like when we have around 300 files that we need to run through astrometry.net, it can really slow things down a substantial amount and oftentimes it won't work. So, Dr. Aaron Shaw showed me uh, a while ago an algorithm that could be written, and he used it for a very specific use case, but I think it could be generalized further, uh, where locally you can open up a file and find the locations of all the stars in the file. And then instead of uploading the entire image to astrometry.net, you send uh, the locations of all these bright objects to astrometry.net, and then it will let you affix the data that way. So then you're not uploading as much data and there's less questioning of it. Um, the totality of this uh, observation can really be summarized as, we have an interesting thing that we want to learn more about. And there's not a lot more to um, to add to these types of programs besides just making them more robust. And so that, that's the main plan for the future of these programs. White dwarves and all of their fundamental operations are very important to uh, cosmology though. And so uh, 
understanding these and forming these automated pipelines leads to uh, further advances in science and making uh, these observations easier in general so that we can expand upon them in the future. And uh, that's my presentation. Any questions? So impressed with the delivery, mm -hmm. walking us through, taking us kind of from a broad and then into a narrow field. <clears throat> I, I do have a question. Can you go back to the data point slide? This one? No, all the way back to where you've got 1,660. No, go forward. Oh. That right there. So I am wondering at what point does a data point qualify as a data point, even though it has, like you're saying right here, the, the telescope didn't track correctly. Right. And, so and what's the value? And my question is, is what's the value in keeping that data point that isn't so good as opposed to trashing it? Uh, I don't think there's a lot of value in that. Um, data points is really what I'm just calling the individual image files. Okay. We could totally trash them. There's not a, a huge need for that. And for a lot of them, it would require uh, a somewhat manual operation. Um, storage space is not, we're not hurting for it. So there's not any need to, to trash anything yet. Um, and unless it's an image like this that has very obvious issues with it, right? Um, trashing it is usually not the best option because you're deleting it for forever. The, there's not a lot more to it than that. Um, in terms of like the, the plots, right? They're, they're not included in the plots. And in fact, a lot of the data points um, won't be included in the plots if they have too large of an error around them as well. Though the, we still have the apparent magnitude that we measured from them um, in, a, in a CSV file. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. So uh, you have a wrapper around Photometry Plus. Where do you where do you get the data? Does it pull the data directly from the Great Basin Observatory website? Right. So the data is synced from uh, the Great from a machine at the Great Basin onto a machine here, and then uh, I have a cron job that runs every day, and it uh, anytime there's new data put up there, it will. Well, it runs every day and it checks to see if there's new data put up there. And if there is new data put up there, it will run again and it will create these plots again. Um, and it will, it will send it to uh, the Dropbox folder where it can be viewed by myself and Professor Blockin and Dr. Shaw. Fantastic. I'm wondering if you could just identify what are the maybe two or three things that you feel like you learned by going through this process? Like the, the mm -hmm. I mean, I know you learned so much, but like. Well, so yeah, there are, there are a lot of ways to take that question. The first one is I knew nothing about the physics behind everything. And it, there is a lot more detailed physics description in my thesis, um, but I, so I learned pretty much the entirety of how intermediate polars work and accretion mechanics, things like that. Um, in terms of programming, I think it was more of like a, a piecewise thing. There wasn't, there's not any huge specific one takeaway. It's more a small series of uh, individual wins, you know, like a reading for documentation for Photometry Plus, understanding how to uh, put all that together. Uh, you know, several of the libraries that I used, like Typer, it was my first time using it. Um, so there are a lot of smaller programming things that I, I did pick up on. Um, a few things like, uh, you know, running something on a new computer is always going to introduce bugs if you're doing it for the first time and you didn't have a uh, super stable environment from which you're coming. You know, at, at first I was running uh, my program over all of the data that Richard sent me just on my laptop. And then when I switched to the Linux machine for the first time, I forgot <laughs> to change a lot of my constants that were pointing to specific directories. So that introduced bugs and there were other things that introduced bugs. Um, so really just a lot of it was also work ethic, just sitting there and making sure to get all that done. Any more questions?
you have any questions? Any questions, Aaron? Well, I mean, me and Aaron have had plenty of times to ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's thank Ben again. Thank you. It's normally the part where we kick everyone out of the room and grill Ben, but me and Aaron discussed on Slack and congratulations. It's a clear pass. Oh, thank you. So we don't need to do the other part. So. <laughs> Oh, nice. Nice. Congratulations on graduating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. I kind of miss not getting grilled now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I'll have your grade up uh, today or tomorrow. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I don't, I, I guess we're done here. Um, if uh, any of you are interested in reading my thesis, uh, Rich does have a hard copy here if you want to leaf through it, or I can also just email you or send you some other way, uh, the thesis. Um, I honestly might just put it up with my uh, GitHub repository as well. well. I was gonna say, you've done, you've um, done a ton of work on GitHub, documenting things and yeah. organizing things. So I'm, I, might, I might throw it up there. Um, if anyone wants, wants yeah. more copy, they can have this. Uh, have yeah, I tried printing a few more copies, but our, our printer kind of died a little bit.